They would sing these risque songs, like Stick Out Your Can, Here Comes a Garbage Man, and uh, <laughs> Teeny Weeny Wagon, and a bunch of tunes. And uh, that is the infection, I think, that led to, to no, anyway, uh, and, and, and uh, when I was in high school, I was in the choir, and we would sing uh, Cleftone tunes, the band from Queens, I guess, little girl of mine, and we would sing tight harmony singing of uh, doo-wop songs together. This is in Missouri. And uh, then uh, there, was, uh, there was all that jazz, and then I used to go to the Kansas City Philharmonic where I would see uh, Frankie Lyman. In fact, my girlfriend, that's probably why I didn't marry her, went into Frankie Lyman's dressing room and left me in the corridor. Boo. <laughs> Anyway, if it wasn't for Frankie Lyman, I would probably be driving an Eskimo pie truck in Kansas City. <laughs> no, I, I'll give that honor to it. reading Hal uh, when I was a senior in high school. It changed my uh, dimensions and directions. Um, anyway, so I come to New York City. I had been exposed to a lot of country and western music. I used to go to see Roy Acuff and, and a lot of country and western singers in Kansas City. And I would also see the rock and roll acts. Little Richard and Bill Haley in the Comets. I was surprised to see, I saw Bill Haley in the Comets in 1955 while there was a knife fight behind me. That's why I remember and somebody was getting stabbed and while Rudy was on, you know how he used to mount his base? So we go forward to 1968 and the Fugs are in Gothenburg, Sweden and we got invited to be a guest of honor at the Bill Haley show. By God, there was the same song, same set, you know. The, riding the bass. Riding the bass in the middle of a uh, rock around the clock. Um, anyway, so that taught us, don't change your repertoire. <laughs> yeah, if it works, why break it? Anyway, so we started writing songs. And, and I have a, a massive archive, almost month by, I have a, my archives organized month by month, going way back to the early 60s. and. Uh, so I pulled, what we used, what we did, we start, we we were poets first, and we so we started writing songs, and um, uh, t t we wrote about fifty or sixty songs. And t t like Ken Weaver and I would write sitting in my bookstore. Uh, we wrote a couple, we wrote a bunch of songs from our first and second albums. And Thule acquired a tape recorder, and used to. I have uh, maybe fifty or sixty of these little tapes that Thule would send in. Uh, of songs, some of which uh, made it on albums and some uh, didn't. Uh, and I found some good tunes. Uh, so we're thinking about uh, you know, uh, an album called Too Freaky for the Fugs, you know, and like all the ones that were too wild even for our uh, own. Uh, we wrote some songs that were <laughs> out there, even for current standards, and way out there, gone, gone out there in the skyrocket sky. Anyway, so, but we, uh, and I thought we would talk a little bit, so my, I came with this, uh, he was anarcho-Hasidic in his uh, <laughs> musical background, and I was more rock and roll, uh, Hank Williams uh, with a lot of jazz that I'd been exposed to. And then I had gone on a lot of on civil rights marches and I had been in the south uh, in Tennessee in the I think the very town the Klan was formed in a church in 1962 and the Klan was, had surrounded it and were going to burn the church down. And what did we do? We started singing together civil rights songs and, and gospel songs. So I, I a number of experiences like that uh, imbued in me the, the thrill of group singing and communal singing and singing together. And so my generation tend to have a, a lot of guitars on hand and a lot of singing. So I brought that uh, uh, that spirit to the to the fugs. Uh, and so Thule began writing these songs. But I know from working with Thule for four, 40 years that he is never happy with the lyrics. You always hear about painters that, you know, they have to block, uh, who's that guy, Balthus or somebody, they had to 
keep him from coming into the Louvre and you know doing a little touch-ups. And this writing, working with Tully is just that way. It is uh, he'll make changes. A lot of times we have to sing harmony with him. He'll make a change just before curtain time because he's always adjusting uh, his lyrics. So Tully, how? I noticed the other day, you have all your songs collected alphabetically, right? For the last 30, 40 years or what? Somewhere, yeah. Because I asked for an old song over the phone the other day, and he went over to the filing cabinet and was able to find. So you have them alphabetically or chronologically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, alphabetically, chronologically. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when you, uh, for instance, I have, uh, I mean, I assume people here know our, our songs and they're going to, so I have here, uh, I've started collecting and sequencing all the early Fug songs and also the first drafts. And uh, uh, when we recorded one of Thule's most wonderful songs, uh, very uh, been recorded by a whole bunch of people uh, called Morning Morning. Uh, first of all, what is this based on? Is this based on? It's not based on a commercial Yiddish commercial. The melody line for Morning. No, this is, is this a Morgan Morgan or what is it? No, it's one of the few songs that sort of. Uh, you know how writers bullshit you. How this song just came to me. <laughs> well, this is about the only one that just came to me. All the rest, I came to them. But you, you wrote it on what sitting I was in a pretty, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, you said you were sitting in a yeah, studio. Yeah, the woman, I, the woman I wrote it to, I just she was a runaway. Remember those? And um, I remember you sitting with her in that stoop and writing these lyrics. Really? Anyway, go ahead. Well. Um, she was about to be sent away to rehab, and uh, that was bad for me too. That I, I would, I needed some rehab too, so I wrote this song, and uh, didn't help. No, I mean, and uh, it was uh, a good song. Yeah, we just did this before to in Prague. A bunch of singers, uh, group singing, uh, went over very well. They gave it a standing ovation. Uh, the thing about it is, when we recorded it, this is a clue to some of you who record your songs. Uh, tru truly, we had the lyrics. This is when the fucks. We had heard that Peter, Paul, and Mary had taken 128 takes to do leaving on a jet plane. So we were determined to get morning, morning done before all the, the number of takes that Peter, Paul, and Mary had used for leaving on jet plane. So we were up to 97, 98. Uh, so Thule wrote out, it wasn't in those days, you couldn't really comp, you know, create vocals from like 10 different versions and you couldn't really do the kind of syllable by syllable editing you can do now with Pro Tools. Then it was more of a live feel. So we were looking uh, and so Thule wrote, uh, and it's, it's useful, I don't know if we can do it, uh, do it like that, is the different emotional feels he wanted for each verse of Morning, Morning. Um, like uh, the, not the verse, nighttime, nighttime kills the blood upon my cheek. Uh, he said he wanted sadness and anguish, i.e. mellow despair. <laughs> yeah, my despair now is not And then for the final verse, uh, you know, that wonderful verse, Starshine, Starshine, feel so loving in the Starshine, 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 darling, kiss me as I weep. He says, melting, mild joy. Quote, yes, Boy, this, is this is the revolution, this is the resolution, sliding into the contradiction of human life. You remember you tell us, you go to Eartha Kitt who's singing this, Eartha, look, this verse here, you're, what we need is a little more melting, mild joy on the final verse. And, uh, yeah, we're, I could we're use sliding, some of that myself uh, right and, uh, now. And Eartha, we want you to be sliding into the contradiction of human life, joy over sadness. Over you sadness? Did? Joy over sadness. Anyway, the point is, the idea is to create a, 
an, an emotional grid for how you want the performers to perform uh, the song. And the result was for a bunch of guys that had never really been in a recording studio, uh, it was um, uh, quite a quite a thrill uh, and quite a good result. Um, so we go forward. Every we we were. Uh, the Fugs. We uh, began. We decided to start performing in theaters because we were more of a. We felt we could uh, have a quote normal life unquote and and work a theater and live in a and work work off Broadway in theaters. So we played first uh, the Bridge Theater, which is now what is it now a boutique or something next to the St. Mark's Bed. It was in, we did midnight shows there, and all of a sudden. Limousines started to show up. You know, there'd be. We had this song about toe queens, and uh, you know, to, uh, anyway. Uh, uh, Tennessee Williams comes in. Well, personally, I prefer Peach Pits. You know, uh, anyway. Uh, well, Tennessee, when we played in, in behind the Premiers Theater, Tennessee showed up, I think, with his boyfriend, and there were benches there, and he fell asleep. To, he slept during the whole show. <laughs> I guess he had a really back. good time, yeah. It was a little well, they started to come, rough. you know, uh, who was Elizabeth Taylor married to? She showed up. Kim Novak, remember giving <laughs> Kim Novak a Fugs t-shirt? And we, we were into marketing. And of course, now you guys, you everybody, you're making, you know, I don't know, you're, 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 you're marketing wildly if you have a band now. Those of you in the room are probably have a wide, but then we were, we were advanced in marketing. We had, we were the first band to market Fugs uh, spray painted panties. <laughs> and I was looking for the stencil for the, I figured that's an eBay, uh, you know. Anyway, I was uh, I, somewhere I have the stencil for those black sheer panties we were selling uh, at the at Fugs show. And then we marketed uh, t shirts. And then we put out a, one of the first avant garde bands to put out a songbook and this and that, though, too to go with our uh, stage act. And when we played theaters, we decided to go off Broadway, and we ran first at the Bridge Theater. Then we went to the Astor Place Playhouse, which is across from what is now the Public Theater. We ran there for a while. And then we went over to Greenwich Village uh, to uh, the Players Theater in the summer of 1966 and into also 1967. We played there, and the Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Inventions were uh, at the Garrick Theater, right around the corner on Bleecker Street. So we were exposed uh, during those years to the, that that particular folk rock revolution going on. And how many performances then? We did about 900 performances wow. at the Players Theater. Uh, we had a playbill even, and uh, and then we then we we had we won. We had a lot of uh, surus, as they say, a lot of trouble with uh, various recording uh, companies, and we wound up on uh, Warner Reprise. And how did that happen? We got, we made an album for Atlantic, and Ahmed Erdik and, and the people that listened to it uh, uh, were not enthused. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on Jack Off Blues, Cuthbert. You cost us our our contract with Atlantic. <laughs> No, it wasn't that. It was that they were selling Atlantic. They were selling Atlantic to Warner Brothers, and they didn't. They felt it would lower their Private. price if they <laughs> kept the fucks on. So the irony of it is, after they, we got tossed off Atlantic, we signed with Warner Brothers, the <laughs> company that purchased uh, Atlantic. And uh, what happened then is that the president of Atlantic of uh, President of Reprise in 1967 had to play our album for Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> who was, who was uh, I guess, I, well, he was, it was his idea to call it Reprise Records, and he may have been a major owner behind the scenes. I don't know, he had a lot of sway, as they say, in the, in the biz. And so he said to Mo Austin, according to what Mo told me, that I, I guess you know what you're doing. <laughs> Thus began our, and I must say that they never tried to censor us uh, in the years we were with we priests. So mar marching along with that, well, first of all, we, 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 were, we were not trained at the Juilliard School of Music. 
and we did not have, um, that's why I was interested in here, I'm always interested in learning how Tuli writes his songs, because I, I've been, uh, we're, we're getting ready to do the Fugs final CD part two, and uh, <laughs> Tuli is turning out wonderful new songs, and I've been tracking how he does it, and it's a construction process where he, he mutates it, I know you mutate your language a lot. Uh, as it goes along. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I have a friend who uh, knows how to work computers. And I'm a computer uh, demi-literate. And everything she tells me, uh, oh, this is so easy. This is so easy. And that's, uh, I look at her like she's an idiot. And, um, that's sort of the way it is with me. Uh, writing songs is uh, so easy. I wonder why um, everyone can't do it. So uh, I have a few hints. Um, this is communication. It's language, right? And it's uh, drama at the same time. Um, if you take a sentence, you remember the person who was surprised to find that he'd been speaking prose all his life? Well, uh, poetry is uh, excited prose, and song has something uh, quite mysterious added to uh, poetry. Early poetry was, uh, classical poetry was almost always sung, I believe. <coughs> so I. <coughs> I don't know what the, the music is kind of magical because um, uh, if you listen to classical mu music, a music without words, it can still move you very profoundly. <clears throat> so um, if uh, anyone gives me a sentence, I can make up, you could make up a melody or a song to it. <laughs> Somebody, give me a sentence. There is no end. There is no end to my beginning. There is no beginning to my end. Not a great song. <laughs> it is a song. Genius! And uh, you can do it too. Well, what, you, what you're saying is that a, is a set of uh, vowels and consonants uh, suggest or yeah. invite a certain melody. Right. I mean, uh, speech is just bad, uh, bad song. <laughs> so you can make it better by uh, adding some uh, music to it. You know. Song to it. And some languages, of course, are uh, much more musical than others, like uh, Italian is more musical than uh, Icelandic, right? <laughs> okay, well. Uh, <laughs> no, but. Uh, none of us know what I like. What? Well, there is a, I found in, in the songs that you write that there, there is a, uh, a strange, I wouldn't call it spiritual, but there's some sort of power of the, of the melody lift, lifting into the words and making them a, just a powerful, strong statement. Yeah, I think that comes from... Uh... Jewish education, where you traditionally get beat up by the uh, Muhammad who teaches you the uh, early language. Yes. <laughs> by beating you, yeah. yeah. There's a song that goes, If will not gain Sukheda, while the Rebbe Shluk could say it, I don't want to go to school because the teacher's beating me up all the time. What is the Yiddish? What? What's the Yiddish? If will not gain the cheder, while the rebbe shluk is seder. 
That's the drum part. <laughs> and then we ought to put that on the folks' uh, final CD part two. We're going to have a folk uh, uh, melody, a folk uh, rhapsody, of, uh, and then have a bunch of Thule's jokes. He's got these magnificent uh, jokes from his uh, experience in life. So we're going to have a, a whole sequence of Thule's. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you, yeah, you heard of stand-up comedy? I'm going to do lay-down comedy. <laughs> yeah. Now you get a little old and lay down. Anyway, the Fox, uh, the Fox, as we started recording in 1965, we recorded on a two-track. And our, our experience in the 60s uh, matched the experience of other bands in that the early records uh, for instance, the Beatles recorded four track up through Sgt. Pepper. And they might have, can you imagine? Well, first of all, like the, we, talk, we mentioned Frank Sinatra. A lot of those are early uh, Frank Sinatra, Peggy Lee uh, orchestra songs were 16 generation mono to mono tape recording. In other words, they have a good quality tape recorder here, a real tape, 16 inch reel, and one here, and then you pass it through with the orchestra then you add overdubs with another pass, you add the lead vocal with a third pass, you might add some harmony singing and touch up you know, a couple of trombone fills, but all in like 16 passes. And some of those uh, recordings are still very beautiful, and obviously, and very wonderful to listen to. So when we did our first recordings, you know, I thought I could have a nice old age and no one would know about the fucks, but we have more CDs out there. We, more albums out when we were wild young men. But basically, we recorded these things on two tracks, one take, uh, at, a, at a basically uh, Jingle Studios in, the, in, the, in Midtown. Then we went to a, a Harry Belafonte had a, uh, owned a recording studio up by, Link, where, by Lincoln Center, what would be Lincoln Center. And we recorded there, and that was four tracks. And so they were caught up with the Beatles already doing four track. And then by 1967, 68, 69, came eight track. First eight track, then 12 track, then uh, 16 track by the time the Fugs broke up in our first manifestation. So we, we tracked this revolution and the ability to overdub. And, but also the wah-wah pedal was invented in 1968. We, 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 we turned Jimi Hendrix onto the wah-wah pedal because it was a marvelous American invention and we got a hold of an early wah-wah pedal and Jimmy was playing downstairs at the wah and we, our uh, equipment man showed him this wah-wah pedal and it sort of changed American music. Uh, it shows that America can be totally evil if it, if it can invent something like the wah-wah pedal. <laughs> So our, our, we slowly, you know, uh, learned how to uh, polish our art, and uh, I would say also that some of the origin of the Fugs came from, uh, uh, I had written a bunch of melody lines to William Blake poems. Why? Because I'd read that Allen Ginsberg had heard uh, William Blake's voice in an apartment in 1948 in Spanish Harlem recite, Ah, Sunflower, Weary of Time, uh, from the songs of experience. And that was the first Fug song because I was uh, waiting for my future wife, uh, Miriam, uh, outside a class at New York University. And this melody line came into my noggin. Ah, sunflower, weary of time. That's setting that, that little poem to, to music. And uh, that was about 1959 or 1960. So four or five years later when I had uh, Tuli and I formed the Fugs. I, those were some of the first uh, things we re-recorded re or sang. We, we decided to do poetry. And, to, and, be, and I mentioned this because the technology, especially in sound reinforcement, and these wonderful new microphones and sound systems that we're developing, that the words could star in the mix. There was no way for the music to overwhelm the mix. So thus, when Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young sang at Woodstock in 1969, they were able to be, the words could be heard. And that's not easy because those mid-ranges 
can really blow out speakers. So they had developed a technology that helped us off Broadway. We used the same, some of the same uh, sound guys that did the Woodstock Festival. We all we bought equipment from them to play off Broadway, with the goal of having the words star in the mix and the words shine in the overall electromagnetic uh, shot. Um, <laughs> then, we need to take a break sometime. So now we're huh? We need to take a break sometime. What time is it? Is it it is about halfway through. It's 5 o'clock. Okay. Do you want to take some questions first? They come uh, back to our, what would you like to do? Well, we, we could... Uh, we just took your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, clear, clear, clear. Uh, let's take a couple of questions and then we can have a break. And uh, what, what, is there anybody that has comments or questions or uh, is interested to ask us stuff about? Um, uh, we have a, a lot of knowledge on songwriting and. and uh, Jesse, go ahead. I don't want to interrupt Ed. <laughs> no, go ahead. Please interrupt. Did you guys say how you got your name, the Fugs? Where? Uh, couldn't put uh, Warner, you know. Uh, <laughs> Frank, Frank didn't wouldn't approve of fuck. So uh, no, we we what we did, uh, uh, w and it's a practice I always have in all my books. Is I, I write a long list of possibilities, and uh, Tuli thought of the word fugs. Uh, I got it. I stole it from uh, Mailer's. So. What was that for? Naked and the Dead. Naked and Dead and the Naked. And uh, I always blamed him for being uh, a sissy for not using the word fuck, but the original, I just found out recently, see you find out too late, spoiled our whole relationship. Mm -hmm. That it was the publishers who insisted on uh, Spelling fog, fog uh, yeah. the wrong, didn't know how to spell. So we made oh, it. Oh yeah, Dorothy, this is another wonderful story, but sometimes the stories are too wonderful to be true. Uh, Dorothy Parker met him at a party, Mort Norman, and when they were introduced, she said, oh yes, you're the young man who doesn't know how to spell fuck. <laughs> so we made a list. I still think that my idea for a title, well anyway, we, Fugs seem to be, but I wanted to call us the Yodeling Socialists. <laughs> but uh, it would have uh, put us in a niche market and uh, uh, reduce us to uh, 